think of the sacrifice that the Lord made. Today is Palm Sunday, and the people of that day said, Hosanna, the highest, and then they changed their minds and crucified him this week. So let's think about the sacrifice as we worship together. Stand together with me if you would. The first song is The Wonderful Cross, a great blending of an old hymn with a, this is our song of the month, actually. Blending of an old hymn with a wonderful chorus added to it. We'll sing the first two verses kind of quietly thinking of the Lord. We'll sing about how wonderful the cross is. When I survey 
Father, I pray that as we've sung of truth and as we've looked at the cross and how cruel it was, and how blood flowed, how wonderful it is, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would enable us this morning to focus now on your word. I pray for our brother Ed as he brings the message from your word. I pray you would give him recall and Lord anoint him as your mouthpiece, your spokesman today. May our hearts be lifted toward you. May our minds be more firmly rooted and grounded in the truth. I pray, O oh Lord, that all we do and say in the time that we commit to you now would be a sacrifice that's acceptable, a sweet smelling savor to you. May you enjoy our worship. I pray, O oh Lord, you enjoy our hearts responding to your word now. And I ask for that blessing. Those blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would, and it's time to dismiss the children for junior church. So if you're six years old and below, you can make your way out the back. Follow the leaders next door. Remember, everyone, the door next door is locked, so that the only way in and out is through this door. I appreciate your attention. Sir. Shannon and I are going to split reading this morning. We're in John 5, starting in verse 19 to the end of the chapter, uh, verse 47. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the, his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So, continuing on, verse 31. If I testify about myself, the testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John, for the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard this voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe in the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you will possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him? How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes 
from the only God. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? I am uh, glad that I made it back from the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, this morning we continue our study in the Gospel of John in the latter half of chapter 5, which constitutes the first major monologue of Jesus in this Gospel. Uh, this is a monologue because uh, it's, just, it's presented just Jesus speaking. But actually, he's speaking in response to the Pharisees. In this passage, Jesus makes a number of important theological and Christological claims. And in order to understand all of them, we need to be able to place this monologue into its proper context. So we'll begin this morning by reviewing briefly what we know of the Gospel of John, and especially what we discussed last week while studying the former half of this chapter 5. So first of all, what is the purpose of John's Gospel? What is the occasion of John's Gospel? I realized the other day that it's been about a month since we last considered this verse, but I hope you'll still have it memorized. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, it's not especially often that a biblical author so blatantly divulges his authorial intent within the text, but here there can be no mistaking John's agenda. There were plenty of signs and miracles that Jesus performed during his day, but John has specifically handpicked these signs and these dialogues and monologues and these events for his gospel so that his readers may believe in the Christ. Every word of this gospel is written in order to convince John's readers of the glorious truth that the Son of God has descended upon us for the eternal salvation of our souls. Now, to this end, to this end of convincing his readers of the truth of Jesus, John frequently draws attention to an interesting contrast. The contrast is the unfaithfulness of the Jews, which we last week suggested may initially have been born of mere ignorance rather than willful spite or malice. John develops the spiritual ignorance of the Jews as a major theme as early as the first chapter of his gospel, and this theme continues throughout this fourth gospel. In chapter 1, the Jews don't understand the ministry of John the Baptist. They miss the spiritual subtext because they're focused on the physical aspects of baptism. In chapter 2, the Jews don't understand the resurrection of Jesus. They miss the spiritual subtext because they're focused on the physical interpretation of the rebuilding of the temple. In chapter 3, the Jews don't understand the new birth. They miss the spiritual subtext because they're focused on the physical requirements of the law. Are we starting to see a pattern here? The Jews had rendered themselves entirely blind to spiritual, to spiritual truths by their preoccupation with earthly pursuits and concerns. Even those that are said to believe in Jesus only do so because they are impressed by the physicality of his signs and miracles. In chapter 4, Jesus even condemns these Jews. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, we may consider this spiritual ignorance of the Jews somewhat shocking, given the fact that these people were the chosen nation of God. These people were entrusted with the oracles of God, entrusted with the scriptures. They had been raised from childhood in the truths of God, in who the true God was. 
If we could expect any people to accept the Son of God by faith, it would be the Father's own chosen people, right? Who better could know the Son of God than the chosen people of God? But the unfortunate truth is that the Jews, after centuries of misinterpretation of the Scriptures, and after centuries of misunderstanding God's purposes and who God is, they had forgotten who God was. They had mischaracterized God to such a degree that when the Son of God Himself appeared before them, they didn't even recognize Him. They didn't even know who He was. So abject was their misunderstanding of the character of God that they had begun to believe God to be in some measure without agency. The invalid, the, uh, the lame man by the pool in chapter 5, evidences a belief in what is essentially magic. This invalid believed that God's power was somehow resident within the pool, so that through an arbitrary ritual it might be harnessed for purposes outside of God's express will. To state this another way, he believed that God's power could be used without God's consent or specific intent. What did the invalid believe? He believed that if, uh, if you were the first to step into this pool, when the water got stirred up, then you'd be healed. So he believed that this healing power of God was resident within the pool, outside of God's specific and intentional working of healing. He believed God's power was an impersonal force. He believed that God no longer interfered in the lives of men, and that God's power was used by men who somehow knew how to tap it. Basically magicians. And this is why he believed that being the first to step into the pool when the water had stirred would heal. Now, when Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath, which is a day reserved specifically for rest, when no, when no Jewish person ought to work, the Pharisees accused Jesus of abusing the miraculous power of God by using it against God's will. Their argumentation surrounding this issue was well documented in chapter 9, verse 16. Some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? Surely this Jesus was able to heal by the power of God. Who but God performs miracles? Even the Pharisees admitted, if, if Jesus can heal, it's by the power of God. But to perform a miracle on the Sabbath was to them a breach of the law of Moses given them by God. If the Pharisees were unwilling to consider the possibility that they may have misunderstood the law regarding the Sabbath, then the only logical accusation they could level against Jesus is that Jesus was using God's power without God's permission outside of God's intent to keep the Sabbath. Jesus' response to this accusation is twofold. First, he intentionally heals this invalid on the Sabbath to demonstrate that invalid's mischaracterization of an impersonal God. He demonstrates that what this lame man by the pool had believed about God, that mischaracterization is essentially identical to the Pharisees' own mischaracterization of God. By placing so much emphasis on the physical requirements of the Sabbath, the Pharisees had unwittingly made the same mistake that this invalid had. They had decoupled the power of God from the will of God. They saw God's power as impersonally resident within the physical requirements of the Sabbath law. Just the same way that the invalid saw God's power as impersonally resident within the pool. Now whether or not the Pharisees realized this subtle attack of their faulty theology is unclear, but Jesus' actions upset them all the same. Now, Jesus' second response to this accusation against him is this passage, this lengthy discourse. Chapter 5, verses 19 through 47 which he directs specifically to the Pharisees who had doubted that he acted within the will of the Father when he healed this man. Now this discourse is, of course, our passage for this morning, which we can split into four major sections. There are four big chunks that we can, uh, that we can understand this, this monologue by. Now in the first big chunk, the first big section, verses 19 through 23, Jesus disabuses the Pharisees of the notion that a man can utilize God's power 
without God knowing about it. How could anyone use the power of God to perform miracles without also having God's permission and specific intent? How could that possibly happen? If then Jesus does have God's power, then he must also necessarily be acting in accordance with God's will. And if so, then those that reject him also reject the Father. That's the line of logic in the first section, verses 19 through 23. The second section, verses 20 through 24 through 30, is a rather involved elaboration of salvation and judgment in which we could easily lose ourselves for a week or more. Uh, but this morning I'll only preach one sermon, so we'll just briefly summarize that section. In the third section, verses 31 through 39, Jesus establishes that his claims are supported by numerous testimonies. He's not the only one claiming to be the Son of God. He has the testimonies of others to prove that he is the Son of God. And this distinguishes him from the other false messiahs of his day. The other messiahs are false, for they testify of themselves and seek the glory of man. But Jesus is true. Others testify of him, and he seeks only the glory of the Father. Now, in the fourth and final section, verses 40 through 47, Jesus continues a thought started in the third section, and he condemns the Jews for their unbelief. The Pharisees, Jesus states, have put their faith in Moses. They've put their faith in the law of God, since they themselves say that they value the law above all else. But if they really understood the law of Moses, then they would have understood that Moses had been writing about Jesus all along and they would have accepted him. So that's a summary of the four big sections of our passage for this morning, and so without further ado, we'll begin our exegesis in the first of these. Chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. Jesus' first response to the Jews who accuse him of abusing the Father's power is that the Son, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. Now, essentially, Jesus' first order of business is to put to rest this myth that he could possibly be using God's power without God's express authority. This statement is a specific rejection of what his, acu what his accusers imply, that he had managed to somehow draw upon God's power without the Father's specific intention or consent. By stating that the Son can do nothing of himself, Jesus is here explicitly arguing that he is working with God's direct authority. Jesus gives four justifications for his argument here, each denoted by the word for. So you get a little, a little four for four there. When I wrote that joke, I thought it was a lot funnier. It's a lot, funnier. It's a lot but I guess y'all are like way healthier than me. So that's, really cool. that's great. Now, the first of these uh, four justifications is found in the latter half of verse 19, which says, For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Jesus here implicitly claims the Sonship of God and explica explicates the logical conclusion of this contention. First century Jewish society was in many ways socially stratified in what could be considered a caste system. You all know the caste system in, is in uh, India? Well, in first century Israel, it was exceedingly common to see sons grow up and inherit the profession of their fathers. And indeed, Jesus himself is indicative of this social stratification, since he himself succeeded his late stepfather in the profession of carpentry. Now, in a similar way, if Jesus is the Son of God, then he takes up the trade of his father. In this way, he could not be said to be acting outside the will of the Father since he learned to do what he does by the Father. Now, the second justification is found in verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will all marvel. Now, this is similar to the previous statement, yet nevertheless emphasizes a distinct aspect of sonship. If verse 19, the previous verse, declares 
that the Son does whatever the Father does, then this verse, verse 20, describes how the Son does whatever the Father does. It's because the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He is doing. Now, due to the unique relationship between the Son of God and God the Father, then, as Carson observes, if it is true that the Father loves the Son, then it is no less true that the Son loves the Father. And we see this because the Father displays His love for the Son by His showing the Son all that He does, and as well, the Son displays His love for the Father by His perfect obedience to the will of the Father. The logical conclusion, then, is that by His obedience, the Son functions as a perfect revelation of the Father. If the Son does everything that the Father does and is perfectly obedient to Him, then by looking at the Son, you get a concrete glimpse at the will of the Father. And it is by this principle that Jesus can later readily state in chapter 14, verse 9, that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Again, this directly refutes the accusation leveled against Jesus that he is somehow abusing the power of God. Now, the third justification is verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Here, Jesus exemplifies the former two justifications by claiming the same power to raise the dead and give life that the Father has. Jesus claims here to have the, po the power to give life and to raise the dead. Now this statement should not have come as a shock to the Pharisees, who were already willing to admit that Jesus' ability to heal was in fact sourced in the power of God. What's interesting here is 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 provide an interesting insight into the prevailing Jewish attitude regarding resurrection. In this passage, a valiant warrior named Naaman hears from his wife's Israeli servant that the God of Israel can cure Naaman of his leprosy. So, Naaman's king sends him to Israel with a letter. And this is what 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 say. Naaman brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Now, what does this passage reveal? Well, for one, it is clear that the Jews believed that the power of resurrection belonged only to God. Only God can raise a man from the dead. Only God has this power. But for another... This particular king of Israel in 2 Kings equates God's ability to raise a man from the dead with his ability to heal a man of leprosy. In his, in his mind, curing a man of leprosy and raising a man from the dead were equally, exclusively within the jurisdiction of God. Only God could do either of these things. Now, it's safe to say that the Pharisees of Jesus' day also considered the raising of the dead equivalent to the giving of life. But if so, then the Pharisees had already all the more reason to trust that Jesus is the Son of God. If Jesus is able to heal an invalid who had been sick for 38 years, then surely, surely by that same power he could raise a man from the dead. It's the same healing power of God. And it follows then, if, if Jesus can raise a man from the dead, then he must be God. For only God has this power to raise men from the dead. Now, the remaining verses of this section, verses 22 and 23, constitute Jesus' fourth and final justification for his argument here, for his uh, self-defense to the Pharisees. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now Jesus has already shown in verse 21 that he has the power to give life to whom he wishes. And now here, he also claims the converse, the inverse statement. Jesus 
also has been given the authority to judge. He doesn't just have power over life, but with the authority to judge and the authority to get me, could condemn. <laughs> with the power to give life and the power to judge and condemn, he also has the power over death. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not enough time. Now, many contend that there is a tension present here between verse 522 and verse 317. What does chapter 3, verse 17 say? For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, there's a little bit of a tension here, right? Because in this verse, uh, Jesus says that I have all authority to judge and to condemn. But in chapter 3, he says, well, you know, God didn't send me to the world to condemn, but to save all men. But this tension is artificial. Jesus' authority over the future eschatological judgment does not preclude him from presently acting in the interest of the salvation of man. Now, as we know, inevitably and tragically, there will be people that do not accept Christ. And because they don't accept Christ, they will be condemned in the final judgment. But until that time, Christ is ever-present and always willing to accept those who choose to come to him by faith. Now, these verses conclude the first part of Jesus' self-defense, and in the second section, he continues this thought of salvation and condemnation by describing two kinds of people. He describes in this next section those who will be saved and those who will be condemned. Those are the two kinds of people in the world. Uh, so chapter 5, verses 24 through 30, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now as I mentioned earlier, this is a section of scripture in which we may easily lose ourselves in rigorous study and analysis. But I've come to realize that there are only so many sermons that a man can preach in a single Sunday morning service. And the exact number seems to be 1.37 <laughs> sermons, but I'll try not to go that, that long this time. So this morning we'll only hit the main points of this second section here. Certainly Jesus is here speaking of the eschatological culmination of the prophecies of Daniel, since he makes clear mention of a final judgment of works and apparent reference to a resurrection of the dead. However, the primary thrust of Jesus' words here is simply to make a distinction between those who are given life and those who are condemned. Jesus claims this power and authority from the Father both to give life and to condemn, but what's important is that his choice is not arbitrary. His choice is not random. As he states in verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. By these words of Christ to the Pharisees, readers of this gospel must know that the difference between salvation and condemnation is not the will of Christ, it's not his own whim, it's not a random or arbitrary choice, but it is faith, and only faith, that is the difference between salvation and condemnation. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death and into life. Jesus' purpose in condescending to the realm of man is to save man from eternal punishment. 
But this salvation must be received by faith. Every man has a choice. By stating that he judges not on his own initiative, but justly by the will of the Father, Jesus is distancing himself from the result of any particular man's judgment. The power and authority are certainly God's, and they are certainly the Son of God's. Yet the choice remains in the hands of the judge, e judged either to accept gracious salvation by faith in Christ, or to receive just condemnation on the basis of sin. Christ's judgment is entirely unbiased. As indeed Paul indicates in Romans 2.11, there is no partiality with God. Now Jesus proceeds in the third section of his defense to establish his credentials to the Pharisees, which is a fourfold testimony which proves his deity. Jesus states in verses 31 and 32, If I alone testify about myself, then my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. Now Jesus knows that there are plenty of false messiahs running around. And even if these false messiahs do not necessarily claim that they will fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament, there has never in the history of history been a shortage of self-aggrandizing politicians who will do anything to secure power over other men. People have placed their faith in con men before. So what distinguishes Jesus for, from any of these? Indeed, by Jesus' own admission, if his were the only testimony that they had of his divine authority, then his testimony would be false. It'd be inadmissible. It'd be invalid. He'd, um, he'd be relying on claims that were just as strong as the claims of other false messiahs of the day. But Jesus insists that there is another who testifies of him. And he here refers unmistakably to God the Father. As Jesus will shortly demonstrate, he has divine witness to authenticate his divine authority. He's not like other false messiahs of the day that only had their own word to rest on. But God the Father is witness to Jesus' sonship. Now, Jesus' first witness is John the Baptist in verses 33 through 35. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice in this light for a while. John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit of God to serve as the herald of the coming Messiah. In chapter 1 of this gospel, he bears witness to the delegation sent to him by the Jews, and later he publicly identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As Jesus indicates, John's messianic witness was enjoyed for a time by the Jews. He says, You were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. John's ministry had clearly raised messianic anticipation and excitement among the Jews, even if their conception of the Messiah was colored by erroneous rabbinic interpretations of the day. But John's witness would have proven incredibly fruitful had this messianic anticipation and excitement been characterized by a desire for spiritual renewal rather than for earthly expectations. The problem with John the Baptist's ministry wasn't in John the Baptist's it was that the people to whom he preached were still focused on what was earthly. They were still missing the spiritual subtext. However few remained faithful to John's message, it is clear that the ministry of John the Baptist was an outworking of the will of the Father. And this outworking is valuable evidence of Christ's Messiahship. But Christ nevertheless states that this John the Baptist is actually the least of his witnesses, for the testimony which he receives is not from man, but from God. And so the second witness to Christ's own divine sonship is Christ's own works, as he states in verse 36, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. Now, 
Clearly, any man that comes performing signs and miracles as Jesus had must be doing so by the power and authority of God. And even the Pharisees were willing to admit this. However powerful John the Baptist's testimony may have been, it paled in comparison to the self-authenticating nature of Christ's own signs and wonders. By his miracles, Jesus elicited faith from Jews that would not have believed in his message otherwise. What does he say in chapter 2? He says, is it chapter 2? No, it's chapter 4. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, though Jesus says this in chapter 4 as a condemnation of the Jews, it nevertheless admits the presence of a sort of faith. And so Jesus' miracles, his signs and wonders, had elicited a sort of faith. As well, the powerful witness of these signs is such that John the Evangelist saw fit to elaborate only seven of these signs in his gospel in order that his readers might believe. He handpicked seven miracles to put into his gospel so that people would believe. It is clear that Jesus' miracles attest to his divine sonship. But even this witness, even the witness of Christ's own works, is not greater than the next. The third witness is God the Father himself. Verses 37 and 38 say this, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. Now, consider that the Pharisees were a group of men who had refused to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, even after witnessing firsthand his signs and miracles. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being a Pharisee in that day and seeing Jesus perform a miraculous healing of a man who had been sick for 38 years and still not believing that he is the Son of God? Now, this sort of obstinacy could only have been exercised by men who had rejected the Father altogether. They hadn't just rejected the Son, but they first had to reject God the Father himself. After all, to reject the Son is to reject the Father. And Jesus jumps to the logical conclusion that any who reject him, the perfect representative and revelation of the Father, must not have ever heard the voice of the Father nor seen the form of the Father, nor abided the word of the Father. For these men to have failed to recognize the Son of God in their midst, they must not have even known God the Father. Now notably, these Pharisees elevated men like Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, their forefathers, as exemplars of righteousness. Abraham had heard the voice of God when God promised him a nation. Jacob had seen the form of God when he wrestled with God at Peniel. Joseph had abided God's word while he was imprisoned in Egypt. But these Pharisees, for all their knowledge of the Scriptures, for all of their searching of the Scriptures, they had never succeeded any of their forefathers in any of these qualities. Not because they couldn't have heard the voice of God, not because they couldn't have seen His form or abided His word, but simply because they lacked the same faith that their forefathers had. That was the key. They lacked faith. And so they had never heard God's voice. They had never seen God's form. They had never abided God's word. Now Jesus continues this line of thought in the fourth and final witness to his divine authority, which is the scripture, as he says in verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is these that testify about me. The, Phari the Pharisees were veritable experts of the scriptures. This is without a doubt. This is uh, uncontestable. As Jesus himself attests, you search the scriptures. He says, you diligently study the scriptures. However, their diligent study was doomed from the start, for as Jesus also notes, their primary motivation in such diligent study was the hope of final acceptance by God. What does Jesus say? He says, you think that in them you have eternal life. The Pharisees 
had tragically mistaken the scriptures themselves as the primary life-giving agent, rather than the person whom the scriptures anticipated, rather than the Christ. Again, they had missed the spiritual subtext because of their fascination with the physical. They had gotten so caught up in the physical book itself that they'd failed to recognize who the book was talking about. Now, of course, there's nothing inherently life-giving about study of the Scripture if you miss the true meaning of Scripture. Have you ever uh, done that? I did that a lot in college. You get assigned a textbook reading, and you just kind of like... You realize about 30 pages in that you don't know what you just read. <laughs> like, like it's all, it, it didn't even evaporate, it didn't, it, it must not have even gone in. Like, it, it, it never processed, it was just eyes glazing over words. There's nothing inherently life-giving about study of these words. There's nothing life-giving about these words if your eyes just glaze over them. If you miss their true meaning. And Jesus rightly berates these Pharisees for their critical error. In verses 40 through 47, it says, You are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Now, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. Now, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? In this final section of his defense, Jesus identifies the origin of the Pharisees' unbelief. Rather than love God, they loved themselves. That was, the, that was the core issue. That was the main problem. Jesus realizes that he is not received by the Pharisees because he acts in accordance with the will of God. But those that seek only man's approval will act according to the will of man. These Pharisees sought only recognition and praise from other men. They were entirely unconcerned with choosing righteousness if that meant losing face among their peers. They weren't ready to make the hard choices for God. Their pursuit of eternal holiness was entirely defined and informed by temporal and earthly comforts and concerns. It's little wonder that they could not recognize the Son of God in the flesh. Now, ironically, their unfaithfulness is in direct contrast to the true teaching of Moses, whom they so highly venerated. In closing, Jesus speaks to this discrepancy by saying, the one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. Now, it's clear that any accusation Moses brings will not be based on failure to obey this or that command, this or that provision of the covenant, but on their failure to understand the law covenant. They had never truly understood the law that they worshipped, for if they did, then they never would have begun to worship the law in the first place. But as it stands, they had worshipped the law rather than the lawgiver. If they had truly understood the law, they would never have forgotten the person of God, and they would have recognized His Son when He came. Unfortunately, they didn't understand the law, and if they did not believe Moses' writings then how could they possibly have believed Jesus' words? Now, it's almost absurd to imagine that there were men who had seen firsthand the power of the Son of God and nevertheless denied His deity. That they had daily searched the Scriptures and yet entirely missed the point. But as absurd as their situation was in the first century, we must not become blind to the possibility that we may repeat their mistake. Now, there are times during which we may be tempted to read the Scriptures in the same way that the Pharisees did, with alarmingly little regard for the true subject of its pages. It is strange to say, but I must admit, that this temptation to read the Scriptures the way the Pharisees did was strongest for me during those years when I attended Bible college. 
at Bible College, a Bible is required reading on every single syllabus of every class that you take. That's a lot of classes over the course of four years, so that's a lot of going through the Bible. Maybe, you know, the first semester, it's still exciting because you're reading many passages of the Bible for the first time, and you're like, oh, that's cool, this dude got, like, speared. <laughs> that's cool, I didn't know that happened in the book of Judges, but that's a great thing. Would love to do that on my next uh, weekend, but... You know, come your senior year, come, like, you know, seven semesters down the line, it's easy to open your Bible and then give no further thought than what is required to get your paper in with the required number of biblical sources. Mm -hmm. Essentially, my, my Bible had become a textbook. To me. I opened it when I needed a short quotation from my paper, or if I needed to cram some miscellaneous fact before an exam, I used it only for academic purposes. If it wasn't for schoolwork, I didn't even read it. People would ask me if I had an opinion on, you know, hot-button topics of the day like abortion or homosexual marriage or people cohabiting or whatever, you know. And I was always prepared to give the good Christian Bible answer. And I was always prepared. I knew which verses to mindlessly quote. But you know what? For a long time, I'd forgotten what the Scripture really meant. They were just words on a page for me. Words that I was... Mindlessly vomiting. And I realized that when the academic answers failed to accommodate real world situations, real world feelings, and real world compromises, when life's problems stopped fitting neatly into multiple choice questions, you know what? I realized that I'd forgotten something really important about Scripture. And after great pains, I had to relearn it. Now, what did I have to relearn? Well, I had to relearn what the Pharisees never learned. That many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. John wrote this gospel for the specific purpose of eliciting faith from his readers. He sought to convince them of the truth of Jesus the Christ. But John's occasion in this gospel is not entirely unique to Scripture. Now, while it is true that few other books of the Bible are so explicitly evangelistic, they all, nevertheless, share a common core theme. Every single book of the Bible shares a common sim similarity. There's a common denominator. All Scripture points to Christ. What does he say? It is these that testify about me. What does he say? If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. The Bible is about Jesus. And when we forget that, we start to forget a lot of other things. We forget that people matter and that they should be treated with dignity. We forget that people are sinful and deserving of condemnation. We forget that salvation is entirely by grace, that there's nothing that we can do to merit our own salvation. Now, I had this problem in Bible college, but you scarcely need to be a Bible college student to feel this temptation to read the Scripture the way that the Pharisees did, in an entirely earthly way. How often have you gone to the Scripture for the sole purpose of winning an argument? How often have you focused on the little details of Scripture such that you forgot the main point of the passage. How often do we read this, the scripture in an earthly way, rather than understanding its spiritual significance? We forget all sorts of things when we forget this simple hermeneutical key, that the scriptures reveal the Father through the Son. The Bible is all about Jesus. And when we study the scriptures, let us not forget where our focus ought to always lie. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for all the good things that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation of yourself in the Scripture. And Heavenly Father, we realize this morning that we are often tempted to gloss over these words that you've given us to reveal yourself. And when we do so, Lord, then you're not revealed at all. 
we gloss over these words and don't. We're never the wiser who you really are. But Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to keep in mind your focus, to keep in mind the spiritual importance of the Son throughout the Old Testament and the New. Heavenly Father, when we come to your scripture, let us do so humbly. And Heavenly Father, keep this conviction within our hearts. We love you and we praise you, and in your heavenly name we pray.